Excellent. Good morning and good afternoon, as the case may be, and welcome to Deloitte's fourth chapter in our Tech Trends 2021 Unveil sessions. My name is Dalibor Petrovic. I'm a partner at Deloitte and I lead our CIO Tech Leadership Program, um, a program that is sponsoring uh, development of these uh, Tech Trends reports uh, in collaboration with our colleagues from across, across the globe. And uh, this uh, morning, I am thrilled to be joined by my great friend and a colleague, Michael Bechtel, who, is, uh, who has the coolest of all titles at Deloitte. <laughs> he is our chief futurist. Um, so, so Michael, thank you so very much for joining us. Michael is joining us from uh, Chicago. Uh, I, I think I can see it's a sunny Chicago today. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> by Chicago standards. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a warm shade of gray. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> well, uh, for, for, for those of our audience members who've been with us for the previous sessions, you would know this is the third and final chapter of our Tech Trends 2021 unveiling. And in today's session, which will be about one hour long, with first 45, 50 minutes of discussion and presentation from Mike and some reserved time at the back end for audience questions, we are going to cover the final three um, of the trends that essentially discuss interplay between physical and digital and are focused mostly on the people aspect of technology trends that we have captured. Uh, I welcome the audience members to submit any questions you might have using the QA feature uh, of the Zoom platform. And we will, of course, then try to address as many as we can with that. Uh, so Mike, on that note, um, I would like to thank you again for your time, welcome you to our, to our webcast and pass on the mic over to you. Well, Dalibor, first of all, thank you uh, for having, having me and for uh, making space for uh, my personal favorite of our nine tech trends, the, the three that, that deal with that interplay between, as you said, physical and digital, uh, and, and, and maybe more importantly, people. Um, this morning, I woke up, uh, St. Patrick's Day notwithstanding, put on, put on a non-green shirt and cufflinks. And my, my 10-year-old daughter, she said, Daddy, cufflinks. And I said, I'm going to Canada today. And uh, I'm, I'm going to treat this day with the decorum it deserves because it's not every day uh, you get to travel, even virtually, in the last year. So that said, gang, let's let's get cooking. Uh, for for the plurality, majority, entirety of you who've uh, been part of our two prior sessions or three uh, that Dalibor has so kindly hosted, uh, you know that uh, what makes Deloitte's tech trends research different is our insistence on rooting all of the work in first principles. And when I say first principles, I mean real clients that you've heard of and really crunchy stories that show that this isn't just sort of sparkle-fingered futurist projection, uh, but rather, um, you know, in situ technology uh, in practice today. And the other thing that some of you may remember from prior discussions is that this is not our first uh, rodeo. Uh, our team has been at this for 12 years. And the takeaway here isn't to get lost in this blizzard of buzzwords, right? This isn't to say, hey, lo looks like you got gamification wrong, or, you know, good job calling cloud when it was a good idea for someone else to try. Uh, rather, uh, this is a way of saying, hey, every year is going to bring a new cohort of trends to become familiar with or better yet fluent around. Uh, but per 19th century uh, American transcendentalist author, Henry David Thoreau, he said, read not the times, read the eternities. Read not the times, read the eternities. Well, what's that mean? What that means is don't get lost in the a la carte year by year play by play. Look across that top band, right? The decade long story and we would posit the next decade worth of stories 
are enduring measured themes around taking care of the old, right? The core modernization, right? It's, it's not going away. Um, today's AI fueled uh, bleeding edge madness is tomorrow's legacy application renewal, right? Uh, doing right by everyone else, right? Trust, risk, cyber. Uh, the business of tech, the people, right? The, the folks in the seats, be they in an office or remote, that, that make, make the dream go. And then uh, lined up with what I think of as the three traditional layers of the technology stack, uh, the data, the interfaces, and the compute uh, that make information technology go. And, and so with that, we're going to spend a lot of time today on, on, on that interaction side right, on that experience and reality side, because again, that's where tech touches people most. So as Dalibor said, focusing on the bottom uh, triad here today, uh, the troika of rebooting the digital workplace. So that's gonna be a trend about how tech is forming, shaping, catalyzing the employee experience. We're going to talk about bespoke for billions, uh, digital meets physical, uh, and, and and we'll get to the we'll, we'll get to the interesting alliteration of bespoke. Did he just say bespoke? Yes, you hear tr trust a Chicagoan. If we're using the word bespoke, we mean it. And then DEI tech, uh, the application of tools and technology to uh, the important work of making sure that all of our all of our employees, all of our stakeholders, all of our customers are uh, succeeding together. So Dalibor, any comments, any questions before we, we jump into trend seven of nine or for today's purposes, one of three? Yeah, I, I love how you grounded us in that comment that the cool new technology of today and tomorrow is the legacy system we will need to modernize and how really foundational that is. Um, and what I really like about, about the whole report this year is that it is actually grounded in that reality. And it talks about you know, how organizations need to tackle that foundation before they can e even, even take a permission to move into, into these grander, more, 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 uh, more perhaps innovative and exciting things. Yeah. So that's really, I think, an important one. What I also really like hearing you speak, uh, Michael, is those big big um, societal, technologically enabled societal directions where, you know, the, the interaction is moving us from leaning into keyboard to leaning out to interact with the, 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 the glass right. to, towards the ultimate in simplicity. Yeah. And how AI domain is moving from, you know, analysis of what happened to where we are at now, which is predictions of what will likely happen to the future where decisions will be made by machines on our behalf. You know, Dalibor to that point, and, and you know, if I may just you know, time travel in the, in the reverse. Um, my team and I have been working on a future of AI uh, report. We're excited it, it's gonna drop any day now. Uh, and one of the first things you recognize is that AI isn't new, right? It, 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 AI has been buzzing around as a discipline since 1955. Yep. And there's something, to your point about societal and, and humanistic, there's something called the AI effect, where AI can be loosely described as anything computers can't do yet. And so in 1995, that meant, well, an AI will never beat a person in chess. Yeah. And then the next day, the same skeptics who dismissed the possibility said, well, that's not really AI. Yeah, right? that's right. And so these moving goalposts, right? When you've had a front row seat to emerging tech for, for 25 years, like I've been fortunate to, to have, you recognize that rarely is what's new as big a deal as the hype suggests, but rarely does it not matter, right? That, that, old, that old cliche, we underestimate what we, what we can do in 10 years, we overestimate what we can do in one. And so, yeah, yeah, it's worth looking to the future. You just can't get too certain with any of it. Okay, 
So rebooting the digital workplace, uh, AKA <clears throat> uh, employment in the age of COVID. So this first trend uh, today really hits on this idea that COVID-19 has clearly accelerated a trend that had already been cooking for five to 10 years at most of our Deloitte clients. Namely, the idea that high performers and most work can do that work and that work can be done pretty much anywhere. The idea that place begins to take a back seat to performance and that the idea of location and even to some degree time, right, and time zone um, starts to sort of melt away and, and become a bit of an anachronism. Now, what's interesting here is the idea of COVID as the catalyst, not the creator. Uh, in speaking with folks from traditional office services, less, lessers like Jones Lang LaSalle, all the way through to progressive digital startups, the feeling was, no, no, virtual work has been a thing and we knew it would be a thing. But COVID sped that up by about five to 10 years, right? The normalization of remote distributed work. Now here, here's where, here's where we pivot from, yeah, I know I'm at home on a screen and I'm sick of, sick of it, to the nuance and, and the, the crunch. When we started talking to our clients last April, right, about 11 months ago, right, peak, peak hysteria, the feeling, the feeling was, you know, I'm worried that my, my, my workers are going to be less productive. I'm worried that my teams aren't going to get as much done because their way of working, and this is a quote that we, we hang our hat on quite a bit, are, we're working in a diminished proxy of how we used to work. The idea that life in this tic-tac-toe, Zoom, Slack, Teams, blue jeans experience is akin to what happened when audio file grade LP records were first digitized into CDs and then, and then MP3s, right? Audio files would say, well, it's not quite as, as good as it used to be, but I suppose it will do, right? Well, well, here's the thing. If you think about how digital music played out, yes, we lost some fidelity by going from analog to digital, but look at everything you gained, right? File sharing, a million songs in your pocket, personalized playlists, recommendations, uh, tools like Pandora that can figure out that I like music in minor thirds and Dalibor likes these three bands because they sound like the Beatles. The real takeaway is thinking about digital work as a diminished proxy for what we did 12 months ago is a limiting frame. That's scarcity thinking, right? The abundance mentality is, huh, look at all this new stuff we can do now that we're digital. And so those same skeptical C-level leaders approached us in June and July of last year, and they said, Psst, we've looked at some KPIs, and guess what? We've actually uh, increased productivity in some cases. We've actually found that our teams are more performant in some cases. And we tried to figure why. Why was that? Is it because, per the New Yorker cartoon that's been going around, we're not working from home, we're living at work? No, it's not about 12 and 14 hour days. Rather, what we're seeing is that because all of our work is mediated through digital channels, right? Because all of our work is happening or being conducted via technology, we're kicking off what we're calling digital exhaust or in plain English, metadata, metadata, metadata that allows us to measure where is the work getting done? How is it getting done? Where can it best be done, et cetera, et cetera. And so on the top left of the screen before you, this, this old quote, you can't manage what you don't measure. We're able to measure more than we ever could in a world where everything is mediated through tech and leading firms, organizations, governments, you name it, leading leaders are saying, wow, I think we can do better. If we're, if we're working digitally. And so how does that show up? Well, today it shows up as lift and shift in Zoom and, and Teams and faces and rectangles, hi.
but where it's starting to show up is altogether new ways of working. I'll give you an example. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft is beginning to pilot AI coworkers, right? Now notice this is not AI overlords, right? This isn't the, 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 the inevitable tired Terminator 2 thing. This is AI assistants, coaches that show up in a meeting with you and say, Psst, you're talking too much or you're talking too quietly or give Dalibor a chance. Okay. A inarguably helpful nudge where you might need it in a meeting. On the flip side, you've got tools that are showing up around the creation of a deliverable. Hey, your PowerPoint deck has too much jargon. Hey, this Word document, could you consider using more concise language? Right? I, I project and speak from experience on all these. The real point being, in a digitally mediated world, we can start to realistically imagine digital guides on the side right? Real assistance, right? And this is a far cry from our mother and father's generation of like Clippy, right? We're, we're talking about meaningful digital AI assistance. Now, turning the lens forward, you start to see that this, this generation-long promise of AR and VR is finally starting to get ready for prime time, right? Part of it is because we've got LiDAR on our phones and, you know, smart glasses, smart goggles, all this stuff. Are, probably coming. But a lot of it is just simple notions like, hey, if we're going to have a presentation, let's not sit in a tic-tac-toe grid. Let's go into a VR space where the presenter is up on a simulated stage to create the gravitas, the feeling of place, the feeling of purpose. Okay. There's a startup called Gamer Jibe that facilitated a friend's startup pitch three weeks ago. I attended. It blew my mind. It, it, again, it was not a diminished proxy, it was in some ways better because all the questions were clear and cued. And it, again, optimism goes a, goes a long way. Yeah. Now, on the human performance front, uh, there's also this emerging notion of reconstituting the time, the actual time of the physical workday. And, and, and the way this is showing up is, is simple things like, do meetings really need to be 30 minutes or 60, right? It, it, and back to that music analogy, right? Why are songs three minutes long? Well, with an LP, you could cut about 12 of them, put them on a record and three minutes each. Well, suddenly with MP3s, you know, my kids, gosh, they don't even listen to a whole album. They hardly listen to a whole song. They jump to the good part. Well, imagine work. We're seeing work jumping to the good part. Some of our clients conducting 70 person huddle meetings for 10 minutes to momentarily crowdsource an opinion and then disperse. Can't do that in person, right? Or on the flip side, Dalibor, you and I setting up a 10 hour co-working session where we're just there for each other all day to bounce off ideas and, and build something great. And so again, working in new ways, there is life after Zoom, everybody, right? The first television shows were boring recordings of radio shows. And then they figured out Westerns. And then they figured out spaceships and all the good stuff, right? We're going to look back at 2020 is the year where we started to figure out all the new cool things we could do as digital employees. Now, stop the presses. This doesn't mean the office is going away. I told you about Jones Lang LaSalle earlier. Uh, Marie, the head of R&D for this large commercial real estate services firm, told us, hey, listen, we are actively reconfiguring our huge office buildings, our skyscrapers, from being 20% collab space and 80% solo workspace to the exact inverse. The idea being that the commute is dead, long live the office. Think about that. The ritual of going into work every day is probably not coming back for 50, 60, 70% of what we think of today as information workers, right? What we used to call white collar workers. Right? Um, but the emergent trend is, hey, we're going in next Thursday for a mix of brainstorming, innovation thinking, presentations, and camaraderie. And so the office becomes a periodic treat rather than a 
everyday slog. Dalibor, you, you were giving me some staggering figures on a productivity reclamation that you've you've experienced. Feel oh yeah, so, share. <laughs> no, yeah, it, uh, absolutely. I mean, this this has been uh, productivity-wise by far by a wide margin be best year ever. Uh, and and uh, like we are also very very clearly seeing um, the the stress level of a lot of people who are struggling to manage this environment. And then we are seeing proliferation of technologies to actually help. Mm -hmm. And the very like very recent and very real example is is the deployment of, of of insights that suddenly appeared on our on my sort of email client. Uh, and these insights are AI and machine driven, machine language driven uh, solutions that, for instance, now automatically book focus time for me, weeks yeah. ahead. Yeah. So gr they grab focus time for me. This was fantastic. They're also able to tell me how quickly am I responding to emails. Yeah. Uh, so so this is actually happening. And uh, and and uh, another another um, confirmation of your of your uh, VR AR um, uh, comment is that our next gen academy that we are putting on for the next gen CIO clients uh, in September is actually going to be delivered in a combination of you know Oculus sets to create the digital university experience in classroom yeah. and of course virtual virtual um, zoom sessions as well so this is this is here I tell you um, the amount of orthodoxy and habit and custom that's been shaken up like a like a game board <laughs> over the last 12 months is is certainly something yeah and um you, you know to your point about nudges or, or AI assistance. Uh, one of my favorite examples is, is a piece of work being done to, you know, for many of us who are overscheduled and have meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, not just that idea of focus time, but the idea that when you auto pick a time with someone, that it could do a little better than grab the first slot like a mercenary. Yeah. It picks the best time. Right? It's the best time. That, you, know, right. so, you know, if you know me, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, you went back to right around 10 a.m. Central. You don't want any part of that guy at 4 p.m. <laughs> and yep. so there, there's a lot there. And like anything, there's a risk and trust side, right? Is there an Orwellian threat of knowing too much? Sure. Um, but can leading organizations do better, right? And, and make the world better, right? Can, yep. can we use all this productivity reclamation in service of higher order pursuits? Game on. I, I think all of us on this call are up to that challenge. What, what we are struggling with and what, what I think we're going to um, need to make the fine, um, the, the, we need to make the best decision here is to recognize that there is clearly a subset of the population that is truly struggling with the situation as it is. Right. And the trick is going to be to bring the resources help and assist those who, who are struggling with the, the current situation. Yeah. While at the same time not impeding those who actually are are thriving, because right. the, the uh, barring the the sad uh, the the sad catalyst for this, which is the pandemic, yeah, there are many many silver linings that 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 we should we should recognize. And yeah. you've just described some really really impactful, genuine, real world um, trends that are clearly taking us to a to what I hope. Is going to be in a genuine better place. Yeah. No. Well. Well said, Dalibor. Well said, man. Um, yeah. It, it, you remember it used to be when you were remote, it felt like you were a second-class citizen, you know, on a crackly phone line and trying to get a word in. And one of the interesting talks we had with a um, with, with with one of the commercial real estate firms, different one, was. Um, the new challenge is going to be making sure that those in the office don't feel like they're at the kids' table. Because to your point, those of us with home offices and 4K cameras, it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. If you're a tiny little standard definition head at the end of a legacy telepresence conference table, suddenly you're at the collaborative disadvantage. So uh, yep. brave new world coming. Yeah. Now, we do have some questions coming in, Dalibor. Would you recommend, as our gracious host, that we hit these now or batch in the back 15? Well, look, th th these questions that came up, a couple of them 
are, are relevant to the to the trend we just described. So maybe maybe we can take yeah. a couple. Yeah. Um, so, so one was about like what what would what would be those must have things to do in the office in the future, and what would be nice to have things to do in an office. What what's your yeah. thoughts on that, Mike? Well, the, the two classes of activity that that seem to be emerging as uh, a, a reason to be there as opposed to beam there, you know. But um, number one, uh, I'm here all day. Uh, but number one. Uh, the things loosely described as innovation. Now, innovation can be an eye roller and some even consider it a four letter word. What do I mean by innovation? Generative, creative, divergent work where the whole body and the hand waving and the whiteboard and the unexpected is an attribute or an asset or, or a feature, not a bug to the work, right? Contrast that with convergent linear spreadsheet reconciliation, like clearly <laughs> yeah, I'd rather be peace and quiet and solitude. So innovation work, collaborative innovation work. Number two, uh, and this is interesting, it's anywhere where the random or pseudo random collisions of unusual suspects are a feature, not a bug. We talked with a head of strategy at PayPal, uh, Dan Tarunian, who told us that they've implemented an app that creates coffee clatches right, coffee and donut meetings uh, between non-obvious, random, or uh, complementary coworkers who don't yet know each other. Because one of the agreed upon deficits of all this digital work is, yeah, I've strengthened relationships with my, my friends like Dalibor, but I haven't built as many new ones. Mm -hmm. And so uh, serendipity and innovation, which can loosely be described as divergence, right? manage chaos that th those are the environments where collisions matter that that's excellent excellent thank you mike you um, another question um is 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 really about so, so it feels like that this is going to be very beneficial for those high performance workers um but how how do organizations treat what is the treatment for those average or low performance workers in this environment yeah you know, it, it's um, it, back to this idea as of catalyst. I, I don't know that this, I don't know that anything here, you know, flips a zero to a one or a one to a zero, right? Like, or, you know, or, or that's abstract. Let me restrict, restate that. I don't know that anything we're seeing here creates like a radical directional change for, for an individual's career trajectory. I think what we're seeing is, um, Let's say, okay, for example, if, if you're an employee who's on, you know, needs a little extra help on a performance improvement plan, you name it, um, you require higher fidelity supports. That means more time with leadership, more guidance from peers, more training, more structure, et cetera. In 2021, those affordances aren't yet there because again, we're in the CD era. We're not in the streaming Spotify era yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think in summary, it, it might be a reallocation of, in, of time investment from leaders to those most vulnerable, to those people who, who are struggling. Because, you know, without sounding, um, without channeling any hubris, Dalibor, I think that our high performers have, in some cases, never felt more autonomy, more agency, have never felt better. Yep. And so congratulations, they don't need your feeding right now, these other folks do. What are yep. your thoughts on that one, man? Well, what I would say is that uh, if, if anything, you, you mentioned what, what gets measured, what gets done. I think that the whole trend of measuring no longer on inputs, as in your heroic drive to work every day, but <laughs> measuring on the actual outputs, yeah. going to, if nothing else, you know, this, uh, give the data clearly to decision makers and it's going to be making it i think ever harder and harder to drive to the office and then spend the whole day doing nothing yeah it will become very apparently visible in that future that we're heading to that's it isn't it that like you said the heroic drive the the the, the pound of flesh the 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 demonstration or appearance of martyrdom has never mattered less I think, yeah it's exactly. probably a good thing yeah 
All right. Well, let's move on. Let's let's move on. Um, while we've we're through half of our time, and maybe even sixty percent of our talking to you as opposed to with you time, the next two trends uh, take a little less oxygen. So we're actually on time. So bespoke for billions. Bespoke for anyone who doesn't speak, you know, Br British English, uh, means tailored. It means artisanal. It means individually crafted. And billions means billions, right? Tons and tons and tons of people. And historically, that the, the idea of bespoke for billions has been a bit of an oxymoron, right? For those who remember uh, uh, 110 years ago, Henry T. Ford with the, you know, or not Henry T. Ford, Henry Ford with his car, the Model T, famously said, customers can have any color they like so long as it's black. <laughs> you know, and and the joke, right? The the century, you know, it's a pretty good joke. It lasts for a century. Was really that, hey, if you want part of this modern industrial miracle, you're going to have to forgo special requests, customization, tuning, uh, you know, individual anything. Well, if you think about it, a generation ago, when internet based businesses, digital pure plays started to show up, they were scale plays. Remember language Dalibor, like rich versus reach, right? Or, or, or clicks versus bricks. Yep. There, there, was, there was this feeling of like, we do this thing that we've always done and it's fancy. And then we have this website, right? So, you know, there was us and there was us.com and never the twain shall meet and, and, you know, different teams, different designers. Well, here's what's happening. The trend that we're seeing is that leading organizations are doing away with this bricks versus clicks, right? This rich versus reach thing. And they're saying, hey, we can actually deliver extraordinarily tailored bespoke experiences at scale to billions of people. How? You know, if I were with one of my college classes right now, you know, Bueller, you, it, data, sir? Yes. Data. Okay. Long, 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 long time ago, you knew your tailor. Your tailor knew you. It was, it was incumbent on the human to have that mastery of the individual needs. If you were with us for our last session trend around feeding the machine, around this idea that world-class AI and ML solutions, you don't bring it a handful of hypotheses anymore. You just feed it a gajillion pieces of data and it will generate features or interesting correlations on the fly, right? Because the machines can now deliver more insights about any given individual than even the old tailor could, we're able to scale customizations. Now, some people would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't new, right? For 10, for 15, for 20 years, we've had things like Amazon's collaborative filtering which you, everybody remembers this language when, when, I, when I'm in person, people usually smile. Remember this language? Customers who bought this also bought this, dot, dot, dot. That was like a larval stage bespoke for billions because what it was saying was, eh, we've narrowed you into a couple dozen affinity groups, demographic, psychographic, you share goals, human describable personas right? 10, 15, 20 years, we've had, you know, urban singles, gray-haired blues, right? Scenic exurbs, right? A lot of marketing firms live on this idea of a persona. And, and they're useful. It's better than any color you want so long as it's black. But where the leading organizations have now gotten to is, I don't have time to name or even understand these personas. We're going to let the math do it. And so as one of my colleagues likes to say, we've moved from the area of mad men, right? The, 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 the creative generative poets of the 1950s to math men and women, right? Which is to say the new marketing and product design smells more like data science than, than design, okay? Now, as we said, this only works when you bring the best of physical and digital together. And this is showing up in two ways. 
One of the ways it's showing up is you've got digital pure plays, companies born into the internet who are realizing they can do better and they can tailor better if they build a physical presence. So you know, of course you start with Amazon, right? They started their little corner shop concept a couple of years ago as a quirky pilot, Amazon Go, where with cameras and sensor nets, they could figure out who are you and what's in your pocket and charge you a dollar for the Snickers. Amazing. Well, in the last year, they've begun to scale that with Amazon Fresh stores. The idea that your shopping cart is like a little mini Amazon Go. And as long as you're sticking to one or two bags of groceries, you don't have to go into the checkout line either. And, you know, inevitably, that'll one day be three and five. And before you know it, you'll be walking out with a TV. But the point being, um, here's a digital company that's bringing the best of digital ops into physical experiences. It happens in the other direction too, okay? Uh, the Las Vegas Raiders, the American football team, has a football stadium, brand new, you know, under attended because of COVID, brand new. You have to have a phone. You have to have a phone to use the stadium. What does that mean? Well, it means they don't accept cash. Your phone is your ticket. Your phone is also, again, your payment device. Okay, but it's not all just reduction. It's the idea that, well, my phone shows me statistics on all the players because it knows I'm a big old geek. It shows my better half the sort of TMZ, gossipy social media backstory in all the players because maybe that's more her. Though in our relationship, it, it might be inverse because she's a big math head. But, but the real point is, um, the digital pure plays are realizing they could do better with a physical side, right? Casper, the mattress company, opening stores. You can book a nap. Amazing. I'd like to schedule a nap. Dalibor, you want to schedule a nap? Um, you've got physical stores who are saying, listen, I, I, I want to have some of this digital affordance too. And so the takeaway is it's not rich versus reach. It's both. And both is table stakes. That allows you to design for that audience of one that we mentioned earlier. And in summary, and this is the third part that's really big here, it enables the new look trust. A hundred years ago, right, maybe 50, there was a feeling that, you know, I knew my baker. And so I went and I bought a baguette and uh, part of it was to have a discussion with him or her but there is this feeling of one-to-one -one trust. We are in a post one-to-one -one trust economy, right? Traditional one-to-one -one human trust doesn't scale. Brands, brands have become the stand-in for trust, right? I don't know who baked this baguette, but I know it comes from Loblaws and so I trust it, mm -hmm. okay? And so incumbent on today's brands is this recognition that yeah, Tuning and personalization are table stakes to compete, but we got to do right by people and their data. We got to be ethical. We got to be explainable. We need to maintain some sort of Hippocratic oath of IT because if we screw up trust, then it's all for naught. It's not all doom and gloom either. To do trust right is the ability to charge a premium, right? We, we have clients who make great margins because they have amazing digital walled gardens that people pay top dollar for to feel safe and trusted and, and you know, have this bespoke experience. Um, if you don't, it's more of a, hey, I don't trust anyone. Last time's trend around trust less, right? There's an equally likely future, right, of trustless, dark web, Tor, blockchain, crypto, that whole movement is sort of in math we trust. I can't trust anybody, I'll trust the chain. For those companies that have a rich history of, of brand, um, I think people can still trust you. Dalibor, questions, comments, thoughts? Well, this is clearly enabled by, by data plus compute plus the infrastructure of the network, right? And yep. What I really liked um, from from the previous conversation was actually an I, I like an, now when you hear it it's an obvious comment, but uh, for the last fifty years that IT has been embedding into the business deeper and deeper and deeper, we've been collecting, sorting, managing data, so that small number of people 
can make very small number of decisions. Yeah. But we are now at the point where compute plus data plus infrastructure allows us to make billions of decisions all in parallel and all concurrently. Yeah. And when you actually think of it that way, then there is you're 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 freed. You're you're freed from all of those con constraints. Yeah. And that really allows that bespoke experience for billions that feels perfectly made for me but it's made for all of us perfectly for us right right it's right it's it's um you know you, you never looked want to look to superhero movies for philosophy but you know with with that privilege comes great responsibility and we all know and we won't name you know the concern about having you know two billion different realities around and all the rest but but i think when it comes to you know something like you know recommending a peanut butter or a suit or an auto, there's a lot more utility than risk in having that tuning. And I think a lot of leading organizations are, are increasingly frank and open about it. I mean, I, I got a, a pop-up from Twitter a couple of weeks ago and it said, hey, and, and really had language this casual, it said, hey, do you wanna receive less interesting ads? Because we'll use less of your data. You can have less interesting ads or, or are you good? I'm like, oh, I'm good. And th that, that idea of that binary, that like dark malevolence versus shining white knight. I think it's giving away to kind of a transactional continuum. Like, mm. hey, I'll give you this, you give me that, good. Yeah, excellent. This is this is very good. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Quest. So there's a couple questions. Should we look to these briefly? Sure. And yeah, then, of course. Yeah, we can, we can do that. Yeah. So as a yeah. physical meets digital and required skill sets from information workers is changing at a much accelerated pace, what is the advice for leaders to ensure their teams continue reinventing themselves to become and stay relevant? Oh boy, D Dalibor, I bet you have just as good, good of thoughts as I do on this. Would, would you flip a coin, who goes first? I've been talking an awful lot. Um, so, so I think that, uh, so what we are seeing, and this is actually, it's a separate report I'm gonna call on that we published earlier this year. The, um, we are seeing for the first time ever, that uh, the, 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 the skills that CIOs and tech leaders are looking for and hiring into, the top number one is creativity, mm -hmm. then it's cognitive flexibility, then, then it's ability to continue to learn and passion for continuous education, right? Yep. So I think that, uh, I think that um, the, it's, the onus is on leaders to bring in people who are going to have this mindset of continuous appetite, willingness, and excitement and curiosity. Um, and, and so that's sort of, I think, the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate end and, and state where we all should be striving towards. Yeah. Um, I think that meanwhile, while that is happening, the onus also is on leader to, uh, to, to paint a clear vision, the clear end state state as clear as it is possible, given how fast technology is changing, uh, and, and communicate it in a way that will be inspirational and motivational for people to actually lean in. Yeah. No, I, digital high five, brother, because I, I think um, w my team, I mean, you spoke to, to the real research. I, I can just validate it with my intuition that flexibility with depth that that's the standard that I'm seeing emerge at my clients, namely uh, smart generalist can connote easily bored, <laughs> you know, flitting around all the things, but never yeah. getting terribly deep. Uh, I have an old colleague who says he looks for serial specialists, which is a way of saying <laughs> able to transform into something world-class for four years and yeah. then do it all again. Yeah. And uh, harder to find, then maybe you know, a Java certification. But, yep. but when you do, you, you've got a stem cell that can grow into whatever's needed next. That's, yeah, I love it. It's a stem cell. I love it. Yeah. So it's, it's really higher for attitude and aptitude, don't hire for skill, right? Yeah, that's it. That's it. <clears throat> so, so, so Mike, let's move on yeah. to the next one because I'm cognizant we're about 50 minutes from time. And yeah. meanwhile, I'm going to go through these questions and, and, and get them ready for, for, the, for the conversation. Beautiful. All right. Well, gang, if there was ever a, um, 
it, you know, cliches are cliches for a reason. And so when I say last but not least, I, I say it with intentionality because there is nothing least about this. Um, it, you know, for those of you who were paying attention to civilization over the last uh, 12 months, uh, <laughs> this needs no description for those who haven't. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, but there's been a global moment of reckoning this last year around matters of social justice, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, from a business standpoint, 93% for a, a Deloitte study in, in late 2020, 93% of client CEOs consider DEI to be a strategic priority, uh, something like 85% a strategic imperative, a must do, not a important. But only 13%, 13 say their organization is, quote, very ready to address it. Now, um, this is a human topic, maybe the most human topic of our tech trends. And historically, DEI has been managed by human resources, which can sound like, a, like an anachronism, like, you know, talent management, human capital management, you know, wh whatever, you, whatever your organization calls it, great. But historically, this has been a story of um, uh, talks, webinars, book clubs, trainings, but you know what it hasn't been? It hasn't had a lot of tooling. It hasn't had a lot of tech that can help the CHRO walk that walk, right? Walk that talk. And so, for example, what we're seeing is a new era of application of AI, ML, AR, VR, like, like the whole toy box of goodies that we've talked about over these last three, four sessions and today. It's the application of these seamlessly into the way we interact with and manage our people so that we can achieve not just the financial outcomes we're after, but the shared and increasingly explicitly recognized social, right, cultural and values outcomes that we're out to achieve. Let me give an example. Uh, imagine a manager who's preparing for a performance review who, because the system knows all these things we talked about in the prior two trends, can say, hey, here's a 30-second anti-bias training that would be useful for you to take ahead of your next five interviews, right? Imagine, similarly, you're putting together a job posting using all of the best practices and language you've learned over your 25-year career, right? And you don't intentionally try to leave anybody out. You're just doing your thing. But as we've come to learn, a lot of bias, a lot of, a lot of exclusion isn't dark male malevolence, right? It's sins of omission. It's, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that or say that, right? AI, ML, natural language processing can hop right in there and say, okay, don't say this, say this. Clean that up, tune that up, do this, be better, right? So this takes shape in a variety of, of places these opportunities. The first is around recruitment and advancement. Um, we just talked about you're writing a job review. You know, there's, there's existing, or not review, a job posting. There are existing human capital management suites that are starting to roll in these sort of tacit bias language detection and remediation packages as a feature. On the flip side, to the surprise of no one, there's an army of startups start like tap recruit or textio or on gig who are jumping in and saying, Hey, um, we can do you one better and give you data driven insights about what, uh, to what degree this posting or this, uh, job description is inclusive, will be well received by historically underserved or, or vulnerable communities, you name it. So really interesting, again, applications of the same tech, but to social as opposed to financial maximization outcomes. Um, there's a startup we've come across called Mojo Rank, and again, no, no interest in them. This is all research. Uh, they will intelligently rank job candidates based on their resume text against the openings in your job opening text and do it in a way that minimizes the wrong kinds of human heuristics. Well, she'd never be right for that. He'd never be right for that. Well, the math says maybe, right? And... Um, if you recall our strategy engineered trend a couple sections ago, 
the idea that robots don't have ego, right? Robots don't have career risk. Uh, the nice thing about an AI in this kind of a capacity is it, it, it excels at objectivity in that sort of double blind, that double blind work. Um, the second basket where this can show up is in leadership and, and in culture. Um, we talked about these guides on the side on tools like Zoom, Slack, Teams. Um, we've come across capabilities that can look for unintentionally biased language. As a Chicagoan, I say guys all the time. Hey guys, everybody's a guy. My 90 year old grandma's a guy. My you know, three year old daughter's a guy. Hey guys. Um, imagine a real time translator that doesn't, you know, they always say coach in private, praise in public. The wrong kind of bot would like make a show out of it. Stop saying guys. The right kind of bot would just reply to me personally after I say that and say, consider folks, consider y'all, right? And so th this idea of algorithmic nuance to make us all a little bit better, to recognize clicks, right? Who per the social network analysis is being left out? As, as our CEO, Dan Helfrich likes to say, um, we, we want horseshoes, not circles, right? Because circles are closed and don't let people in. Mm -hmm. So how can we use NLP to get horseshoes? We'll let more people in. Um, historically, that's a series of trainings. Right? Going forward, it's becoming a series of thoughtfully constructed social graph analyses and tooling. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. The final bit is around measurements and insights. It, it's really this idea that, hey, you know, historically, this has been, even collecting this data has felt a bit taboo. Like, what if we collect it and it's bad? Right? Are, we, are we at risk of litigation or, or worse? Um, um, what we're finding is that back to that spirit of you can't manage what you don't measure. Part of what's trending here is this recognition that to be better, we need to see better. And so plugging in um, dashboarding tools like uh, Vizier, uh, Tableau, and, and making sure that this all feels opt-in, that this feels like you have the option, but not obligation to share these sorts of things about yourself. Why? Well, so that we as an organization can be better to you, uh, to each other and, and to our customers. So um, with that, Dalibor, you know. Well, this was this was really fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike. You um, got it. We do have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions cool. and the number of them have been coming in. So uh, there, there is one thing uh, of questions that asks what, what about brick and mortar, high touch businesses in the context of this rapid digitization integration with between digital and physical but also what about uh people who 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 have made their careers and li livelihoods being focused on high touch interactions with customers yeah. and this sort of comments on that well it's sensitive stuff and i think the worst thing you can do and I would, I, you know, I, I have no named individual that I'm teasing with this comment, but th th there is a certain kind of a um, smug family of responses that says like, AI will create jobs. Nobody will get hurt, right? And, and a lot of us just sit there. My, my father-in-law, I remember like when he hears that sort of thing, he's like, Fah! <laughs> what I would tell you is, I think roles, roles get radically disrupted I think people have opportunities to, to pivot in, in a big way. And I know that can feel like an unsatisfying answer, but if, if you're a traditional brick and mortar retailer, you know, you sort of have two paths in that choose your own adventure. You, you either get on board the kind of digital, physical, better together train and, and compete, right? Or you might find a creative differentiation. You might say, we are delightfully non-digital we are purposefully anachronistic and that's part of the reason you'll love us, right? Yeah. And so that I think on, on that side, there's sort of a, an existential moment of, are we gonna create our way out or compete our way out? For the individuals, again, it's, yeah, certain classes, I mean, I mean, you can make the argument that the robots, not only are they coming, but they have been coming for a generation and that's part of the musical chairs we're all feeling and the insecurity, yeah. but, um, 
how to, as leaders, gracefully create opportunities to take care of our people, to, to use that automation not as an excuse to take payroll from eight to seven, but, but to free that displaced person to work on something uniquely awesome, right? And hope that doesn't that, sound saccharine. That, that, this is fantastic. A um, couple of, a few more questions. I want to, I want to make sure we jump that we, we put, uh, that we an answer. A um, couple of them on the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, is there a view that metrics around DAI will become elements of the financial statements and sort of the brand value statements in the future? Yeah, we're we're, we're already seeing it. We're already seeing it. Um, we have a rich tradition of not speaking about clients that we haven't expressly gotten permission to speak about. <laughs> but I would simply say that there have been handfuls of companies that have historically attached their triple bottom line mojo to their annual report, right? I, I can think of hiking and outdoor apparel companies come to mind. But what I, what I would tell you is this is going from corner case to common case, maybe not majority. But it, to, it, it, if you're a certain disposition, this needs no defense or explanation. What I would say to perhaps more um, skeptical attendees today is think of, it, think of it about managing externalities. Go forward businesses need to show that they are able to manage the wake that they create in the world as a means of ensuring their sustainability and survivability. Mm. In short, if you, if you hand over a billion dollars in profit, but, but you create a noisy bad time for, for, for third parties, for employees, for counterparties, you're gonna have a bad time. Yeah. And so that triple bottom line becomes less virtue signaling and more of a demonstration of adulting in the new normal. Thank you for that. Here's an interesting comment about businesses can be jumping into new technologies as fast as technology is changing. So what is Deloitte's strategy to help organizations in making the balance of this fast changing technology versus business? Uh, so what, one thing that I, that I would say, and then I'll pass it on to you, Mike, is sure. that to me, part of that answer has to be in the role of a technology leader as an evangelist and educator, bringing the business savviness, tech savviness of both their peers, the executive, and also very importantly, board. Yeah. Lack of tech savviness at boards is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing across industries. Yeah. And CIO has to have an element of that of their role to be that educator. That would be sort of my answer. I don't know, Mike, if there's anything to add. No, to that. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, man. I, I, I agree. I, there's such a chasm between the card carrying geeks and the, the proverbial suits. <laughs> that translational function is Isn't absolutely needed. I mean, you know, for those of you listening, like if you tell if your kids are wondering what to major in, it, it's that, you know, translating wizard to muggle and muggle back to wizard. <laughs> it's important. Um, Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Excellent. So a last word for you, and then I will close with announcing our next session. Mike, um, any, any book suggestions for people who might be interested to sort of explore more some of these interesting topics? Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, you know, one, there's a really interesting book, a totally unexpected. It's not even really about tech. It's called the clock of the long now. It's mm -hmm. 30 years old, 20 years old by Stuart brand, Brian Eno, the record producer, Danny Hillis, former CIO of Disney. Um, they recognize that we, we have such a fetish for, for the moment in the crises du jour that we sometimes underthink 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. And, and that's what really got me into futurism was this recognition that it's it, an appreciation for history and the future can ground our decision-making today. Um, so that, that would be one book, that, rack. That's fantastic. Yeah. One thing that I would add, being an eternal optimist, is The Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. I think it's, it's a fantastic book that should put everything in, in a bigger context here. Um, uh, so he's great. Isn't he great? He's like, he's fantastic. he proves that you can be a data-driven optimist. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Mike, I want to thank you very much on behalf of our audience members for this time. We are now at time. And I would just close by inviting everyone to join me for our next interview session 
on our conversations with tech leaders shaping the future of Canada. I'm very, very excited to welcome Catherine Nuello, the CIO of Air Canada, our national airline. And she will be joining us live on March 31st this year, same time as this session. So Wednesday at noon, I look forward to seeing you all rejoining us. And meanwhile, Mike, we'll obviously stay in touch. Thank you very much. All the best to you. Happy St. Patrick's Day, pal. Toodaloo. <laughs> See ya. Bye.